Hi, everybody. Dr. Nikita Visniak here with the amazing Richard Liebert. And Richard, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself so people understand what you've done for research and uh, the publications that you create? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've been a registered massage therapist in Ontario for 12 years. I've worked at a bunch of different clinics, different types of clinics. One's a large multidisciplinary clinic. Now I'm working in a small town. I uh, teach at Lambton College. Mm -hmm. And so through them, I've had an opportunity to participate in different conferences and different research research work. And then I've also been able to work on an open educational resource. And some people may be familiar with that. Um, here's a printed out version, but uh, evidence-based ma massage therapies. And uh, also collaborated with uh, Dr. Visniak on his latest, yeah, right there, latest edition of the massage therapy test textbook. And in that, we're just kind of breaking down, looking at different mechanism of action and looking at treatment of different conditions. And yeah. Yeah. And so that gets us to the big question. How does massage therapy actually work? Based on the research that you've seen and the writing that you've done, how does massage therapy actually work? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, so it is a really hard question to ask. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I started working on because you can ask 100 different massage therapists. You may get a lot of similar answers or you may get people that diverge quite a bit from that similar answer. And I think it's somewhere in between where there's like gonna definitely be a lot of neurological stuff. Then you could say contextual factors and I actually made a, a good image. It potentially is in Dr. Visniak's book, I know it's in mine, where we have overlapping circles like a Venn diagram of there's gonna be contextual factors, there's gonna be effective touch, so just interacting with someone, uh, mechanical factors and neurological factors, and all of them are overlapping. So it brings up an interesting question because you see a number of people are just claiming neurologic effects are the primary outcome for massage therapy. Yet yeah. we've shared a number of articles back and forth where it's been mechanical effects of massage yeah. therapy. So what do you say when someone says, oh, it's just neuro. If you try and give any kind of system or hands on thing that's going to involve yeah. in actual effects, you're probably not reading the current research. What do you think? What do you think about those statements? Yeah, I would say the best researcher right now to look at some of the work going on for uh, like a mechanical effect or or uh, would be Dr. Jeffrey Bove and with Susan Chappelle, who is, I don't know if yep, I said yep. that. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. You don't have to say anything there. Susan is a major contributor right yeah. here where she talked, we have a whole chapter on scar tissue and the mechanical effects. Over a hundred references actually she put out there for that content. So, you know, it's, yeah. you know, there's more to it than just the neuro interaction, right? Yeah, so when you look at their research, what it is is mostly in uh, animal models, but they've been able to repeatedly demonstrate that there is going to be a mechanical effect, and that's on the nerves and on the connective tissue around the nerve. And if you think about, yeah, neurologically, nerves are innervating everything, sensory, motor. If there is a entrapment or irritation or inflammation building up around the nerve and that's what's primarily causing either reduced blood flow or reduced movement of the nerve sometimes mechanically that nerve needs to improve that rain that uh movement and that oxygenation right yep. and so what they've been demonstrating in animal models is by doing and a lot of this is very gentle treatment, like it does not have to be deep to have that effect, mm -hmm. is that they're improving that the mechanical factors related to the nerve and the connective tissue around the nerve. Yeah, exactly, right? So we can see that even though there is neurologic components of it, we do see a balance in between, just like you said at the very start, of neuro versus mechanical versus biopsychosocial, all that stuff plays together as an overall picture. Yeah, and I think one of the big thing, it's like, so when we're saying a uh, biopsychosocial approach, you're not taking out bio, you're not taking out psycho, you're not taking out social, like, these are all interactive, right? Um, and you're not trying to remove a mechanical thing, right? Like, maybe they are not as important. Sometimes they may not be 
as relevant as what we've been taught or what we think, but to completely take them out and say, oh, people, some people can heal without that mechanical, uh, I don't want to say defect, right? But that yeah. mechanical injury, repetitive strain, um, injury, sometimes people will not heal if that's not addressed. Mm -hmm. And why not optimize our non-pharmacological, non-surgical approach to see if we can do that before we send them off to like a surgeon? Yeah, exactly. And that's the key theme that we have in all of our books. It's a progression from least invasive to most invasive. Yeah, Let's go ahead right, and see yeah, all the, the bases that we can check, all the boxes we can check off first before we go to these huge, you know, potentially they also have side effect interventions as well. Patients believe, I'm always educating patients on this, they think surgery is 100% success rate with it, right? They think that mm -hmm. whatever technique someone's offering will have a 100% success rate. And that's not the case for, in fact, almost any treatment that's given. There are always going to be statistical outliers that don't follow through or have different responses and the potential negative side effects that occur with any treatment, including even basic massage strokes too, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That was the thing. So now for so many years, people would say, oh, it's just a massage, it's just a massage. And sometimes the most basic, and this is probably where I've changed the most for how I'll treat, the most basic, seemingly basic treatments can sometimes be very effective. So even like a uh, general Swedish massage, people are like, oh, it's just that. It can be very effective. So don't like be like, oh, it's just gonna be a massage. Of course, some people may need more intense care and all that, but, oh, a general massage can be great. Yeah, so, ther so therapeutic for so many people, right? And I think a lot of people, especially now with our COVID times, we're getting a lot of patients into our clinics where it's literally just haven't had anybody touch them in a long time. Yeah. They're just looking oh, yeah. for patient con or person contact, right? All right. So yeah. now you're talking about the treatments you, te you teach at a college. So what we'd like to know is what are the yeah. basic principles of massage therapy? What are the key things you have to incorporate with every visit? I know that's a big question, but if we could just break it down into some simple yeah. topics, what do you think? Oh yeah. Um, key things I think is patient education. You want to do an assessment. Like I think assessment is key, right? Um, I think there's some good assessment books out there. <laughs> I think there are two. I don't know where I got to grab one here. I, I was looking for one up there. I don't have one. Handy. Bam! There's an yeah, assessment there book go. right there, right? <laughs> but like taking a detailed assessment. So, you know, sometimes maybe you're not finding anything with the assessment that might be reassuring for the patient and you've helped to rule out major underlying things. Exactly. And that's one of the key things. Um, Almost every person, vi patient visit that I have, that's what I'm doing for people. They've seen so many of their practitioners. They want to know, is this, am I dealing with this, this, or this? And I can say, it's not an ACL sprain because of this. It's not a PCL sprain because of this. You can walk through the basic steps and give that reassurance, which is a major focus of the assessment. Yeah. Oh Going yeah. Sometimes people out. will men mention to me, oh, I feel better knowing that it's just not going to be, you know, this disc injury that's going to be debilitating right yeah um so yeah so intake education assessment giving reassurance um reminding people to stay active mm -hmm. the treatment that's probably the one of the most important parts yep and then the self-care so working on self-management options people still always have questions about ice or heat so saying Oh, heat generally can be one of the best things for analgesic. Ice is good, not always needed like we mm -hmm. thought it is, but some people have great benefits with ice. So it's really individualized, but just even people feel better too. They're like, oh, I never know which to use, ice or heat, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, giving them simple stretches. Sometimes people will not, um, they don't feel comfortable doing a stretch unless somebody's talk them through right so mm -hmm. talking them through a stretch talking them through modifications that they can do in their daily life but i'd say that like just doing a complete treatment do the assessments do the treatment do the uh, self-care and do some kind of patient education just to give them um things they can do at home to help manage their symptoms. Yeah, the self-empowerment of people to recognize, number one, the conditions maybe they're looking at, you know, even a disc issue, 
they often feel like they're by themselves. Well, you can just yeah. simply say, this is a common condition. We see this mm-hmm. all the time. So yeah. that's helpful right there for them, right? And then breaking down the steps for it and expected prognosis is absolutely huge for it. I think uh, that's great. And even what I really like about your writing, it's so succinct. And even what you say, it's not patient-centered. Even switching the terminology over to person-centered mm-hmm. approach breaks down that clinical barrier a little bit for people too, right? Yeah, I think that's the big biggest transition we will see in the next 10 years is the transition of a lot of healthcare and especially what we do Mm -hmm. but a lot of healthcare will be transitioning to uh like it's still going to be all of this will be evidence-based like that's the big umbrella and then person-centered right so saying are we over medicalizing a lot of different like daily things right are we giving labels are we telling people that they're injured um, where it may just be a common existence thing like back pain as debilitating as terrible it is there's going to be severe cases like that's not normal Mm -hmm. but back pain is normal yeah right and so it's it's just working with people to find ways that they can manage and help treat themselves Absolutely right. I mean, that's the big thing. Even I gave a presentation at the MTAM a couple of months ago, and it was all about there's research articles that show if I read you an MRI report, it doesn't matter what the results are. If there are big, scary words in there, all of a sudden, the patient perception of their own condition depresses, they actually wind up having worse outcomes because of reading a report, and not exactly what you were saying, educating them well enough, well enough on it at the end, right? Yeah, and that's the tricky part, right? Like, uh, some points interpreting uh imaging like as a massage therapist it's like oh i don't want to what i read it out to you because you'll be concerned about it or i don't ask your doctor but we should be able to read through and especially a lot of reports say these these imaging this imaging may or may not be associated with your symptom like your, yeah. the findings yeah exactly the correlation is poor between what you find on imaging and actual your presentation that's been known for decades right and it's a matter yeah. of just getting that out there for the general public because just like the surgeries the general public thinks oh if i have an mri that's going to tell me exactly what's going on or the x-ray is 100 diagnostic scaphoid yeah. fractures 20 percent of them don't show up on x-ray so you go ahead yeah. and break your wrist, you get an x-ray, it says it's normal and it doesn't show up. You've missed a finding and that's a, actually out there in the literature as well. So yeah. Yeah, right. I, right. I, if I can, one more thing, osteoarthritis of the knee, that will be the, another huge change in 10 years that they will not be doing as many surgeries for yeah. arthritis of the knee. Um, yeah. Still to this day, I'll have so many people come in that are fairly active um, that will say, oh, I got an x-ray, I seen the surgeon, and it's probably going to be a year before I get my surgery. And I said, how's your knee feeling? And they're like, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So right. why, why rush to get surgery based on only arthritis, mm-hmm. not on pain, not on decreased function, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Changes in ADLs. If, it's, if that's not changing, that's again, minimal effective dose. What's the least we have to do yeah. from least invasive to most invasive? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any final thoughts on this then? How massage therapy works? No, uh, I have writings online. I've posted a lot. So my book, Evidence-Based Massage Therapy, A Guide for Clinical Practice, you can Google it, find it pretty easily rmtedu.com I also have posts up there but a lot of people are familiar with the model and I just say yeah don't get trapped into thinking it's got to be one effect right there's many overlapping effects uh context is going to be a really big thing the way you interact with someone um good messages your uh rapport you have with your patients um but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's actually some promising, some compelling research coming out about mechanical effects. The other uh, group, oh, and I won't know, it's in the States. Um, If I do a quick look up, maybe I can find it, but they've been doing a lot of research on uh, mechanical massage. And what they've been able to say is, oh, it does stimulate an effect. Uh, And this has been mostly in rat studies. And I know by reading online that they're doing translational research right now in humans 
and I think that's coming out in a year or two, but what is it? Oh, well, there was one article it. that we shared. It was on University of Kentucky, I think we were looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it is. University yeah. of Kentucky. That is, uh, uh, I don't know the name Hunt. Hunt at all would be the uh, reference. And I, I forget all the researchers involved with that. But uh, yeah, I think it's University of Kentucky and University of Colorado uh, joint research pro projects. But uh, mm -hmm. you know what? I think there is so little research into massage therapy. It's like, there's not enough to say this isn't happening, right? Yeah, like yeah. there is some compelling stuff and there's tons of references out there to read through. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, Richard, hold, hold up your booklet again for us so everybody can see it. I think it's a fantastic resource. Yeah. In fact, that's how I found you. We were just talking back and forth online. Right. And then of yeah. course we collaborated together. Absolutely excellent content. So please go and check it out. And I just want to thank you very much for coming out today. Thanks for having me. All right. Good stuff.